Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. It's um, our new season of the Walking Writers Salons and our guest this evening is uh, David George Haskell. He's widely claimed as someone who will transform the way you hear the world. Uh, his most recent book, Sounds Wild and Broken, is published by Faber and Faber in the UK and there's a chance for you to win an e-book copy this evening, uh, which we'll tell you a bit more about in a minute. Um, to those of you new to the salons, uh, let me tell you first a little bit about Walk, Listen, Create. Uh, we're a social enterprise. We support artists, composers, performers, sound designers and writers who create work on foot or about walking. So if that's one of you and you've just registered to come to this event, then do fill in more about your biography and post and submit um, some of your work to the website. So, uh, introducing David. He's a writer and a biologist. His latest book, Sounds Wild and Broken, explores the story of sound on Earth and is an editor's choice of the New York Times. His previous books, The Forest Unseen and The Songs of Trees, are acclaimed for their integration of science, poetry, and rich attention to the living world. Among their honors include the National Academy's Best Book Award, the John Burroughs Medal, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, the Iris Book Award, Reed Environmental Writing Award, the National Outdoor Book Award for Natural History Literature, and runner-up for the Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. David himself received his BA from the University of Oxford and PhD from Cornell, and he's a fellow of the Linnean Society of London, a Guggenheim Fellow, and a William R. Keenan, or he is, William R. Keenan, Jr. Professor at the University of the South. Is it in Suwannee? Is that how you pronounce it? Yes, Suwannee. Suwannee, Tennessee. So, um, David, I've been involved with Soundwalks, Soundscapes and listening to the environment. Um, so I was immediately drawn to this book. And to me, it's astonishing how much you've covered and how brilliant you've made the uh, the sort of often complex uh, concepts, uh, hypotheses and science are easy to understand. Well, um, thank you. And I'm also, uh, I think I mentioned it before in a conversation we had, I'm absolutely flabbergasted by the breadth and depth of the bibliography. And those of you who've not yet been able to put your hands on a book, uh, it's over 100 pages long. You take us through the origin of sounds and soundscapes, um, and we may talk about that. Um, but with my interest in sound walks, I'm also keen to have your take on how technology over the last 25 years has changed the way we interpret nature as at the same time how it's modified the very nature of which we're part. Um, but perhaps we should start our discussion on how sound reveals a lot about the sound maker. Mm -hmm. If that's OK by you. That, yeah, that's wonderful, because that's, that's sound, of course, is the great revealer. We listen to to learn things and have our curiosity stimulated, and and some of those things are obvious, and others maybe a little more subtle. So, so how did it all begin for humans? I mean, um, I, I read in your book that um, you you can sort of um, you know, the, the research reveals that uh, we're we're not very good at communicating in the forest, so we must have come from the grassland or the savannas. Is that? Is that our origin? Yes, I mean, but even before that, we can sort of think about human sound making in the context of, of what other mammals are doing. And, and we're rather unusual mammals in that we, we learn the vast majority of the, the structure of the sounds that we make. So we're more bird-like than, than mammal-like. And that's one of the things I think that allowed humans to uh, take these great cultural leaps is that we've taken an innovation that most most mammals, most primates have not taken, and that is the ability to learn day by day, even sometimes minute by minute, the, the form of the sound that we're making and use that to transmit information, cultural information, social information, technological information. And that that linguistic ability dates back at least half a million years. And we know this from the, the form of the, the fossilized form of the throat, but also from, from the presence of, of genes that 
unnecessary for us to make our, the language that we use now, those genes were also found in Neanderthals and, and Denisovans. So our closest relatives and to, closest relatives to modern humans had the ability to speak genetically and morph morphologically. Of course, presently we have no clue how or when or why uh, uh, they spoke, but it, it seems very likely that they did. Alongside that, we're incredibly musical species. Uh, we, we've taken the rhythmicity that is present, say chimpanzees like to beat on rocks and rocks on trees in various ritualized ways. Our music takes that uh, to, to other levels and then brings in tool use, which of course is another very human characteristic, craft things that we now call musical instruments, which are essentially sound makers that communicate beyond language or, or alongside or below language. I'm not quite sure about the exact uh, uh, preposition to use. You know, where is music in, in relation to spoken language? Often it's woven in together. And all of that communication takes place in an ecological context. And indeed, it seems that the form of our speech is well adapted to transmission through relatively open country, not through dense forests. For example, when, when I'm speaking, the low frequencies and the vowels would, would transmit fairly well through, through a forest. But all the high frequencies, the way we distinguish consonants one from another, that's all carried in the high frequencies. And those are frequencies, because they're such short wavelengths, they get broken up and degraded and bounced around in the forest. And so our, our voice is the voice of a creature that lives out in the savanna. We hear that the same sort of thing in birds. Birds that nest in, op that nest in grasslands or savannas often have very trilled, virtuosic songs with lots of high frequencies, whereas birds that nest in dense forest usually have slow, whistled songs that we hear as quite melodious. That slow, whistled song carries very well through the dense vegetation. And so human language itself is, is more of a language that fit for, for open country, but also among languages, those languages spoken by cultures that tend to live in dense forests tend to be a much richer in vowels, in extended vowels, whereas those in, in dry climates and, and, clo um, and open country tend to, to have a lot more consonants in them. Well, I remember reading that you, were, you said there was, is it, there were about 6,000 human yeah. It is uh, because I, I used, uh, you know, I used to work in the um, area of book publishing where we used to sell foreign rights. And so I kind of know there are 215 written languages where where the language is there are sufficient market for people to buy yeah. books or read, you know, uh -huh. so probably a bit more, but not that many. And um, uh, and, and then suddenly to read there are sort of 6000 languages and and to think of that variety and that that's evolved. I mean, that's extraordinary. Yeah, and you know, and it's of course evolved um, entirely through cultural processes, relatively recent, biologically speaking. So when I'm comparing, say, birds that live in forests and open country, often they've been separated from one another for millions of years in their evolution, and yet most human languages have been separated by just a few thousand years. A uh, very rapid cultural evolution, and we know this even say within the English language, as English language has, has spread. Uh, around the world, we hear different accents, even different accents and almost mutually unintelligible forms of English within the British Isles. Uh, uh, so we have this part of what it means to be a human is for our language to change very, very rapidly. It, for innovations to arise, for local adaptations to arise. Some of that is getting homogenized now. And many of those 6,000 languages around the world are just spoken by a small number of people. And so the extinction of languages is, is a one way in which the sonic diversity of the world is, is being degraded and lost. Just as we're losing every time a bird or an insect goes extinct, uh, we lose their language, their sound, so too within, within the human species. Well, I mean, the other thing that I thought was really interesting was that one tends to forget, unless one's there 
uh, more often than, than we, we, we often live in cities and we do have a babble of humans around us, but we don't have the cacophony of sounds that you would find, uh, you know, in, 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 in forest. Um, right. and, um, and so therefore you have uh, individuals of different species uh, uh, you know, making louder and louder sounds or more off or making sounds more often just to make themselves, you know, um, either uh, make themselves aware to uh, uh, future potential partners and this sort of kind of extraordinary way in which um, certain creatures, if not many, can identify, you know, who's the who's the healthiest, who's the most handsome, right. <laughs> who's, right. who's the fittest, you know. Well, and, you know, and the degree to which it is a cacophony depends a lot on the time of year and where you are. So, for example, in, in temperate woodlands, uh, far from the subtropics and the, the equatorial region, often forests can be very quiet, particularly during the, the winter season. And it can be some of the quietest places on the earth, just the gentle rustling of wind in the leaves, occasional birdsong. But then you go to the subtropics and the tropics and you might have hundreds of species of birds all vocalizing at once combined with hundreds of species of insects and in fact some birds have evolved to uh, put their song at a pitch that avoids the insect sound and also when the insects are singing the birds just don't even bother making sounds that are going to compete with the insects they tend to sing at a lower frequency and so species mold their, their vocalizations both through learning but also through biological evolution through natural selection to the particular soundscape of place and one of the things that i've enjoyed i mean i grew up in northern europe and then as a young man i was in the forests of north america where it is very quiet for much of the year and lots of poets and and have sort of uh, and in, in literature, we have this sense of, oh, nature is all about peace and quiet. It's not noisy there. But then you go to a subtropical or tropical forest, and nobody there thinks of the forest as a place of peace and quiet. It might be a place of renewal and of great beauty, but not of silence. And in fact, uh, in some places, the, the noise level is higher than standing next to a busy roadway because you've got so many different species vocalizing all at once. And I think that's one of the, the, the sensory marvels of the world is to be surrounded by this, this incredible sound. I mean, sound that is loud enough that when you come out of some of these forests, particularly when the frogs are chorusing, and it's as if you've come out of a loud rock concert because your ears are, are, are ringing or they have that sort of stuffed up feeling you have when you've, you've been in very loud sounds. And all of that is sunlight refracted through life. What do I mean by that? Well, all that sonic energy was derived from animals eating one another and then ultimately feeding on plants or on algae. And those plants got their energy from the sun. So this the energy from the sun got captured by the plants and then gets sent back out into the world partly as, as sound. So we're hearing various manifestations of sunlight as we hear birds sing, as, as we, you know, when I'm speaking, we're hearing sunlight that's come through wheat and oats and other things that I've eaten that then I'm using to power my voice. So we're hearing the voice of, of the prairie in a way. And, and, and another area obviously that you talk a lot about is, is what happens in the ocean. Um, and, and, you know, for a long time when we were kind of watching Jacques Cousteau or whatever mm -hmm. coming around, um, we, we, we didn't ha really have uh, a clue about how noisy the ocean might be. And yet we've sort of contributed to that noise through, you know, obviously by shipping and, and all yeah. sorts. So, uh, no, his, I mean, his first, first and most famous film was called, uh, Le Monde du Silence, the, the silent world, because at that time people thought that there was there was no sound down there and uh, unfortunately the methods that they use then as scientists and ocean explorers use contributed to not being able to hear anything because they were in very noisy aqua uh, suits with bubbles and hissing air and they'd explore coral reefs by by literally dropping dynamite on them and collecting what came up 
uh, to the surface. And so very, very noisy, making so much clamor through the method of exploration, they couldn't hear what was going on. But in the, the 1950s in particular, uh, a scientist called Marie Fish and then others put hydrophones down into the oceans and discovered that the oceans are full of sound. The most famous of those sounds are the whales, particularly humpback whales that, that Roger Payne and others have made so famous, but all, all sorts of marine mammals. But then fishes, there are thousands of species of fish that, that find mates and conduct their social lives through sound. And invertebrates, particularly in warmer ocean waters, snapping shrimp, making their little crackling sounds, one of the loudest sounds in the ocean. So it's extraordinary, extraordinarily rich soundscape. And, and the method of hearing below the ocean is also quite different from on land. We perceive sound mostly through our ears, some of it in our fingertips and in our chests, but most sound that arrives on my body bounces right back off. If I were a fish underwater, I have a, a watery fish body in, floating in water, sound just, it doesn't bounce off, it, it penetrates right into the, the creature. So aquatic beings are immersed in the sound that they're in. And, and this makes it all the more tragic that we are now pumping lots of noise into the oceans through, as you mentioned, shipping, seismic exploration, sonar, creating places that are uninhabitable for many species because of sound. So the food might be there, uh, the ocean pH might be right, the might, we might have stopped overfishing, but if it's so loud that the, the, uh, the sound waves are, are killing creatures or sickening them or breaking their bonds of communication, then these species will not thrive. And so I, I do think one of the places in which sound pollution is the most problematic now is in the oceans, which is, presents a, a problem for the imagination because of course our ears are above water, so we don't hear consequences of our actions. And it's very hard for human ethics to be effective when, the, when cause and effect are not discernible to our senses. And in, in the ocean, cause and effect are very, very hard to, to connect, connect for human senses because we can't hear that. We need hydrophones and technology to open our imaginations to do that. To that world that we thought just fairly recently, until recently, was, was silent. So anyway, you mentioned, you know, that this kind of work in the ocean sort of began in the 50s. Um, I, you know, uh, more recently, the, I mean, this is the area that I'm really fascinated by is you know, how much more we can now consume, i.e. here, because of the, um, you know, benefit of headphones and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, better microphones to record the sounds, uh, but also, um, you know, anyone can sort of slip on a pair of earbuds or headphones and stream sounds and they can hear ambience, they can hear uh, sounds in real life and real time. Um, what what are the things that, uh, and you know, I'm I'm assuming that you know that this actually means that more of us must be aware of our natural soundscapes than we were before. Yes, I mean I think we're in a paradoxical time. <laughs> um, before, I mean before the 1800s, all human experience of sound was of the moment. If you heard music, it was music that was somebody in the room or the, or the worship space or something was making, and you enjoyed it then, and then it was gone because there was no possibility of making sound rec recordings and playing them back later. Same with human conversation. Everything was of the moment. If you wanted to record it for posterity, you had to write it down on a piece of paper, either as words on a page or musical notation. And that was a way of transmitting sound out to the future. And so the experience of sound was very, very precious then because it was ephemeral and therefore you had to pay attention. Uh, and also sound for people who were living in agricultural societies um, or even hunter-gatherer societies, if you weren't listening to the world around you, to the community of life, you weren't a good farmer. You weren't putting food on the table. And so I, I do think, and of course it's speculation because of, I, none of us were around in the early 1800s or, or before, but people 
had a different relationship to sound and perhaps were more highly attuned to at least some forms of sound. And certainly when the first machines came along, uh, steam engines and railways, one of the things that people complained about the most was the sound of these things that sounded like something from hell risen up because this was louder than they'd ever experienced. Even a loud concert hall doesn't come anything close to, or an organ in a great cathedral doesn't come anything close to the sounds that, that a, a great big steam engine would, would, would be making. So we've lost that. And on the other hand, lately we've gained an awful, awful lot because most people who, you know, got a smartphone in their pocket have got a very good microphone. Uh, if you're willing to spend a little bit money, more money, you can get an amazing microphone to capture any sound you want and then share it for free with anyone around the world. And of course, we, that's a, we live in a, um, amid riches and we don't know what to do with it. Right? So you can listen to any genre of music, any, almost any ecological community now. And yet, what do we do? Well, we let our listening be guided by Spotify or YouTube or Amazon and rather than uh, letting, so algorithms determine what we listen to rather than unmediated, open-ended experience. And, and that's one of the things that I think is, is great about walking is that you walk through a soundscape and you have very little idea about exactly what will come next. You don't control it. Instead, you commit to moving your body through the sensory richness of, of the world and seeing where it will take you. So there's an openness to, uh, to possibility there that I think, that I think is marvelous. And is, um, of course, there's, there's a time and a place for listening with headbuds, earbuds and headphones and things. But there's also time just to, to walk or even to sit and just let the sound come to us. I mean, also, I mean, the other side to this is that we now have a, the incredible opportunity of um, analyzing sounds mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, vast areas. And I remember you talked about in the book, you talk about uh, um, an initiative that had uh, gone on, I believe, uh, with the uh, University of Wisconsin and the University in Australia, mm -hmm. uh, where they were recording sounds. Was it in Indonesia or somewhere? But it was so somewhere where they had a sort of hundred microphones running yeah. full time. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you you end up with an archive of so many sounds, um, some of which we as humans can't hear because our microphones are better than our, our human mm -hmm. ears. How, how is all that interpreted? And, and right, well, that's the big question. So what we technologically, <laughs> we can record for 24 hours, seven day, days a week. And in fact, scientists have done this. The experiment you were referring to was in, in Borneo, listening to different kinds of forests, forests that have been um, managed by the indigenous community, others that are managed by the uh, central government and then logged. So the central government allows logging or mining on different places. And one way of assessing the effects of these different kinds of forest manipulation and forest use, put microphones in that then record the entirety of the soundscape. Every creature, insect, primate, bird, uh, mammal, Every vocalization is, is captured and then stored digitally. But then the problem is there aren't enough human ears to, and enough hours in the day to listen to all that data. So you can feed it through a computer and the computer can pull out particular things. Say if you're interested in, in one species of primate, you can teach the, the computer to, or the t computer now will teach itself to pull out the calls of a particular gibbon, for example, in, in the forest or a particular toucan focus on one species, or the, the, through statistical analysis, you can take the entirety of that soundscape, all its different frequencies and changes in amplitude, and the computer breaks it down into lots and lots of little pieces like a mosaic. And then it looks for patterns in that mosaic of, of little tiles of frequency by time squares, and then can report back, well, the forest that is managed by the indigenous community and doesn't have a lot of logging, has a much bigger peak of sound frequency in the dawn for the dawn chorus. It has a much fuller spectrum through most of the day and the night. And you can therefore infer 
that the biodiversity in that forest, the community of life is richer than some other ecosystems where the community is, is there's still lots of species there, but it's been thinned out or changed in some way. And so, so these technologies are a complement to, to human listening. I don't think they should ever replace human listening because the other people who can, who have long-term data, of course, are the people who have lived in the communities in the forest, sometimes for thousands of years, who either remember themselves or have heard from their parents and grandparents, and then stories from people who are no longer with us about what did the forest sound like? What was the forest like? How are things changing? So that's another form of, of technology, if you like, another form of listening that I think has been underemphasized in policy decisions. We tend to be attracted by the shiny new digital technologies, but there are also the technologies of embodied human listening and of cultural wisdom and understanding that, that reveal just as much and then often more than microphones feeding into a computer algorithm. And I think um, these, these are not in opposition to one another. One can feed and support the other. And when, for example, commu indigenous communities want to have their forests certified as sustainable or as carbon stores, having some of these more uh, digital statistical methods can be a real help because then they, they can then show, oh, look, here's the numbers that you certifiers and oversight people for carbon markets and for sustainability certification. You, you want numbers? Here are some numbers uh, as well as some, some knowledge from our culture. Okay, well, I was going to hand over to the audience now, but not, not a single person has chipped in a question yet. So, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, been we need, to, too much. need to prompt some questions from them. So we'll, we'll do a bit of prompting and say, come on, audience, um, post in a question or two, uh, and we'll invite you to um, uh, say, say the question. You don't need to reveal yourself if you don't want to, but uh, we, we'd love to hear your voice. So that's one thing. Um, but maybe uh, the next thing I should ask you about is, you know, uh, how have, how, you know, what, what sort of research has been done on how uh, we've mo uh, modified the behavior of creatures and humans by the mechanical noises that we've been making? I yeah. mean, well, one of the areas which um, I, I know is sort of quite uh, uh, interesting or key at the moment is that is this, is the sound of wind farms and and mm -hmm. how the turbines and modify the behavior of migrating birds, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, you know. Yeah. So so I mean, wind turbines are one part of it. I would say that, that, that in terms of energy use, by far the biggest source of noise pollution is seismic exploration for oil. So the, these are ships that spend months out at sea, letting off explosions from the back of the ship every 10 seconds. And those explosions send sound waves into the sediments at the sea bottom. And then the reflection from those sediments tells geologists where the oil is. And um, at close range, those explosions kill plankton and other creatures. At longer range, they disturb the feeding and territorial behavior of, of fish. Uh, they drive whales out of their feeding grounds. This, it really is extraordinarily um, destructive way of, of finding of finding oil, and there are alternatives that are slower. Um, um, but hopefully, we can transition to some of those alternatives. On land, wind turbines are one form of industrial activity that can change. I mean, they can the sounds of them, but also the spinning blades can affect uh, and harm birds, kill birds sometimes, as well as bats. Uh, but on land, the, the, I mean, the biggest source is, is human traffic and human industry. And we got a good example of this when, you know, during the COVID lockdowns, when the vibration of cars and industry quieted down so much that the seismometers, so that the instruments in the Earth's crust that are there to detect earthquakes recorded a background level of quiet in the Earth's crust that they had never before recorded over a large portion of the earth. So we're making so much vibration and sound that's actually making the earth's crust vibrate and shake, let alone the air above it. And so birds in cities, other animals in cities either have to 
cope with that noise and adapt to it, or they have to leave because they can't hear one another. One way in which they cope is by changing the form of their song. They tend to sing louder and at higher pitches, and, the different, and they change the elements of their song to use those elements that are higher pitched and that don't get masked by this background noise. And again, during the COVID lockdown, there's some good studies by uh, Elizabeth Derryberry and her colleagues in San Francisco in the US, where they showed that sparrows within a few weeks after lockdown, when everything quieted down, the sparrows changed their voices. They were singing quieter and using lower frequencies in a way that they hadn't since the 1950s. So these are, some creatures are very, very adaptable. Those sparrows, I think, are probably pre-adapted to living in urban environments because just naturally for probably hundreds of thousands of years, the sparrows, some of them have lived inland, which is a pretty quiet environment. Others have bred right on the coast where there's often wind and waves crashing on the shore. So it's very noisy. And those ones, those birds with territories there tend to sing higher and louder. And so part of their behavioral repertoire was to be able to adapt to different sounds, backgrounds in their soundscape. So when we humans built a city, they were able to fit in in that way. Some other birds perhaps were not so fortunate and haven't been able to adapt. So. The other thing about noise, I should say, is is that it's a big environmental justice problem. Is that in in cities, most of the noisy roads and industry were deliberate, at least in the U.S., were deliberately located in low income minority neighborhoods, not where wealthy white people were living. Uh, and that once that road is built, it forever changes the nature of the neighborhood, and Sickens people because noise pollution actually inflames us from within and, and is a cause of cardiovascular disease, premature mortality. The noise isn't just an inconvenience, it's actually a, a, a sort of physiological assault. Uh, and so city planning these days needs to be more aware of that and to, and to uh, not deliberately cause, I mean, essentially, the US government was subsidizing racist forms of highway reconstruction to deliberately locate them into what they then call ghettos and that the legacy of that continues to the present day. Okay, well, David, our prompt uh, got some people to ask some questions. So uh, you've got a question which is about um, languages and writing, a yeah. question which is about whistling in the Canary Islands and a question yep. about the environment through your own listening. Um, and um, wh which one would you which one would you like to? Um, yeah, have? well, I can. I mean, a couple of them I can address um, pretty quickly. But in terms of what languages describe sound the best, I, I honestly don't know because um, I don't know that many languages. I mean, um, so I know French and German and a little bit of some others, but uh, English language is limited. I mean, so I also actually have written a book about ar the aromas of trees, and uh, the English language is really bad when it comes to aroma description. Uh, no, that's. I, I will think about that question and sort of ask some of my linguist colleagues whether there are other languages that have a richer vocabulary. Often, when we are describing um, sounds and uh, aromas, we tend to borrow from the visual and use analogy and metaphor. So we talk about bright sounds or, or, or foggy sounds and things like that. So which are really using things from, from the, from, from our eyes, from vision, uh, transferred to the, uh, to these other realms. So that, that's a great question. And I wish I knew more about it. Uh, I will dive into that and, and try and find out some more. Well, yeah, the whist uh, yeah, no, I was wondering because Kim, I don't know whether Kim, Kim, you're based in Australia, so you know, are you thinking that uh, Aboriginal Indigenous mm -hmm. people have a better way of describing? Um, I look, I, that's something that I'm sort of exploring, I, I guess, in my work and working with Aboriginal communities, but. Uh, the languages have been so lost in a lot of cases that they've lost those descriptive words as well. So I, it's something I struggle with in my writing, but as you know, as a soundscape uh, artist, 
you know, you often let the, the hearing do the job for you, but there are certainly times where you, you want to be able to describe those sounds and uh, as wide as your vocabulary might be, there it's it seems a challenge. We just seem to lack the words. Oh, great. You know, and I, I, that's one thing where I think art, uh, so sounds, sound, art and music can help us and I think that's why in a way music is so important around rituals and times of transition is that we realize that no words can can do it all. Uh, and so we create sonic experiences as a way that, you know, they're, they're not directly mimetic of anything around us usually, but they're creating modes of communication that transcend the limits of, of, of language. And, and that's true cross culture, I mean, universally people sing. So they add other layers of meaning to, to words in the song and then also use instrumental music uh, because language can't, can't cut it. So, and you know, the whistling languages um, that uh, Babak asks about, there are dozens of whistling languages around the world and they tend to, these are languages where people are not just whistling to get attention, but are can, through a series of whistles, communicating complex meanings and full sentences. And the whistle languages tend to be where people are either living in very dense forests, so the whistles can penetrate through the forest, or in mountain valleys where you're communicating from one side of a mountain to another, and uh, turbulence in the air and the limitations of the, of the human voice itself mean that the nuances of spoken, normal spoken language get completely erased and degraded as, as sound flows through the air. But a whistle, because it's it's louder and it's also simpler, these whistle languages uh, can, can communicate over a very long distance, sometimes more than a kilometer. And because the grammar within the whistle language is complex and mutually intelligible, then, then uh, Complex meanings can be array, but it does. It, it's like bird song in that those whistled languages take on the timbre and the pacing of many bird songs of birds that let, that breed in dense forests that face the same problem with with sound degradation. So. Um, how about um, Jeff? Do you want to ask your your question? Is Jeff there? He's hiding in the background somewhere. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we yes. can. Yes. Good. Right. Okay. Sorry. I'm only, uh, I apologize. I'm only half in in this. I'm doing something else at the same time. Um, yeah. I, uh, no, I just wondered, uh, ve very interested in, in, in the scientific background to what you're talking about. And, and that must um, really enrich your own listening. So I want, I just, I would like to hear something, you know, tell us what it's like with that information, going into a, a, a rich natural environment and, and listening to what, it, what the soundscape yeah. is. Well, thank you, Jeff, and, and you're an expert on, on on this, and I'd love to hear, hear your take on that. But um, you know, a couple of things. My when I'm out listening, my practice is is often quite meditative, at least at first. I mean, obviously, sometimes I'll record and 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 get technological about things, but force myself to pour my attention into my ears and just wait for the sound and listen for the sound beyond the first one that I heard. Uh, then my mind gets distracted and I call it back to the, to the experience of listening. So again and again, just being within the sound space, maybe describing its textures, but trying to get beyond words and just be present for the physicality of sound beyond story, beyond interpretation, just to be has been very important for me. And I, and I think it's, I mean, I absolutely am drawing from the practices of meditation that lots of religious traditions have and has been part of my practice for a long time now as a writer. My first book was about going to one square meter of forest. The book is called The Forest Unseen. 
and I just return to this same patch of ground again and again through a year to open my senses to it. And then the essays that I wrote about that are informed by science and all, all, all sorts of other things, but the primary practice was showing up, paying attention, and leaving the technology behind. Then, you know, when I want to share things with people, or then I'll go and take photos or, or make recordings. But in terms of listening and with my sort of mind turned more into curiosity mode, one of the things I listen for and with is deep time. So when I'm listening to crickets chirping, I'm thinking that you know, essentially the apparatus that they're using has been around for over 200 million years. And so I'm, and particularly I live most of the year in, in the Southeast of the United States, where there's a very rich singing insect fauna and to be in in the presence of those insects for me is is an experience of time travel. Of course, the insects 200 million years ago were different species, and we have more diversity now, and so it's, it's not literally being transported to exactly how it was. But in terms of the the sound making forms and the uh, and the timbers of sound, it is that way. And then with the birds, I'm I'm again I'm thinking what. What does this bird song reveal about the habitat, about its story? Why is it sounding this way? And I mean, we have people on this call now from around the world, and it, the bird soundscapes in Australia and North America and in um, North Africa, Asia, Western Europe, the northern parts of Western Europe are radically different from one another, not just because the vegetation is, is somewhat different, but because of ancient biogeographic movements of birds. So, so songbirds evolved mostly in Australia, and then there were waves of migration out of Australia for at least some of them into Asia. A few of those made it to North America, a few made it to Western Europe. Different branches of the bird family tree have flourished in different parts of the world. And that's why the southeast of the U.S. sounds completely different from Israel and the West Bank and sounds completely different from the coast of uh, northern New South Wales, even though they're all basically the same number of degrees away from the equator. Partly it's different, different yeah, climates I, and things like that, but, but, it's, but it, it is a lot about deep time and biogeography. I can, uh, that's lovely. Yeah, yeah. I can really relate to that. Um, I'm actually working on something myself that that is how listening uh, can equate to tra time travel mm -hmm. with a slightly Wonderful. more emphasis on how you, 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 you can hear past worlds that are passed on through us, through or oral cultures, you know, mm -hmm. here in Europe, uh, through from the Greek myths to uh, how, how that drifted through into Northwestern Europe and Gallic cultures and yet there are elements that are the same and kind of frame how we hear landscape to 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 some extent mm -hmm. anyway time travel yeah yeah that's amazing well I look forward to that I'll look out for that that's wonderful um okay now I better post some multiple choice questions in but um which I haven't done because I didn't want to distract everyone from the uh, the conversation but I'll start doing that but uh um and Mary asked a question there uh, um, uh Mel do you want to do you want to uh pop in and ask the question maybe she's not there so uh do you want to try that how yeah yeah I mean, the interesting thing about, you know, how noisy are these environments for the species themselves here? Um, interestingly, there's evidence that creatures that live in very noisy environments, like a rainforest, often have evolved nerves and ears that are, that are highly tuned to the specific frequency of their own species rather than having a more broadband receptivity to all sorts of frequencies. So, and which is not what our ears, our ears are sensitive to, I mean, not a huge range, but a, a fairly wide range of, of sounds. And within that, we, it's not just that 
only one sound frequency, like a thousand hertz, is the only thing we listen to. We hear all sorts of others. But there are insects that are only hearing a very, very tiny slice of that spectrum, and or at least they have nerves that are only tuned to that so that when their species is singing, boom, they hear it. All the noise around them, they're probably sensitive to it because it you know, helps detect when predators are coming to get you, but they, they have a much tuned down receptivity to that. Whereas the same sorts of insects that live in less crowded environments, their nerves have a much wider tuning. So they're hearing all, all kinds of things. So through the evolution, not so much of the sound, but of hearing, uh, different species have, have managed to coexist. And there are other examples where the sound has changed, like instead of singing at the same frequency, species when they're together will frequency shift, so they're not overlapping one another. Sometimes they just yell louder and see who can, you know, drown out the other one, as, as anyone who's been in a schoolroom can attest. Okay, that's great. And uh, Kim, you, Kim's um, chip in uh, to go ahead. Okay. Um, so I've been working in the Macquarie Marshes, which is a Ramsar listed wetland in central northwest New South Wales over the last four years. And the first field trip I did out there was in February 2020, where I'd been hoping to actually record sound through the night. And I know that landscape very well. I've, I've visited it many, many times over decades. And there was an eerie silence that night that was completely unnerving. And it was on the back of three years of drought and a fire through the reed bed, the north reed bed uh, in the October before that. And I guess it really made me realise that a silent that silence that everybody seems to seek in their busy lives, and particularly those who live in cities, is actually a pretty serious indicator that there's something wrong with that environment. And I just sort of wonder, I guess, in your travels and, and the environments that you work in, how concerned are you about some of those really rich sonic environments becoming quieter? Yeah, I mean, you, you said it beautifully there, is that when you know a place, uh, and suddenly that place becomes less vocal, less, less diverse. We realize something is not right here. And, and sometimes it might just be a short term thing. You know, maybe you are, when the rains come and things grow back after a fire, species will come back. But we know around the world that mostly the trajectory is not that way. There, there are places of hope and of recovery and all sorts of great stuff. But overall, the trajectory is of loss of natural habitat and degradation of, of species abundance. And I think the signal is clear from many, many ecosystems, not all, there are places that are bouncing back, that soundscapes are becoming more and more impoverished. And in fact, listening to soundscapes is often one of the early warning signs for things having changed that maybe we can't detect because we don't have hundreds of people out there counting every cricket and bird and so on. But just a few minutes of listening will tell you that things are, are very, are very, very different. And so I do think one of the great things about sound recording now is that we're creating an archive, and I wish we had this going centuries back, of at least a baseline for now so that future generations, if we curate things properly, can then listen back and say, what was it that we have gained and lost compared to the year 2022 or whatever the, you know, the, the, trip, the timeline is that they're, they're looking at. So yes, across the world of silencing. I remember my grandfather who grew up in the north of England uh, near Carlisle, he spent a lot of time outside. When I was young, he told me most of the birds that were around when he was a boy and no longer that he doesn't hear them anymore. And it wasn't because he was going deaf. It was because agriculture had become so intensified that the birds had been lost from the landscape. And this was, he was telling me this back in the 1970s and then from the 70s to now, you know, it's another 50 years nearly. Uh, we, we know that bird populations have declined even further. And so and the UK is a, is a particularly extreme example because of the massive changes in agriculture over the last hundred years. But the same is, I mean, many tropical forests are being cleared at an extraordinary rate. And 
so I, th- I mean, for my money, I think tropical forests are the pl- and the oceans are the places where the problem is the most severe. That's not at all to diminish what's happening, the problems in other habitats. But if during our generation, we lose most of the tropical forests in the world, we are not doing the future any favors at, at all. And, and right now, that's, that's what we're doing. So one of my hopes, and it's, I often wonder what else can be done is, is in writing about particularly tropical forests is to bring a little bit more attention to that. Um, because the, the location of power and of, of money is unfortunately still located mostly in temperate regions in the, you know, in, in Sydney, in New York, in Beijing and so on, away from where a lot of the stuff the consequences of our actions are being felt on the land. So that's, and, and again, well, you know, Eddie Game, who works with the Nature Conservancy all over Asia and is based in, in Australia, uh, told me that in communicating to donors and funding agencies, soundscapes are one of the most powerful things he's ever encountered. You can show people graphs, you can tell them stories, but if you let them listen to a rainforest in all its glory, and then a rainforest that has been degraded in some way by turning into a mine or being cut. People immediately hear the difference and immediately understand in their gut, in their body, that this is not good. And so sound, because it, sensory, I really think, and this is one of the arguments I make in the book, is that human ethics are, are largely, or at least partly, grounded in our sensory experience. So sharing the sensory experience of forests in different actually is an act that changes people's ethical compass, which is what we need. We don't need little slight changes in the economy and this and that. We need to think about ourselves as members of the living earth community with because we're a powerful species now with great responsibility. Back a few hundred thousand years ago, we were a species there were hardly any of us. And just making it through the day was a great achievement for a human being, and we weren't causing extinction all over the world. Now, those same minds and bodies are in a different world where we're we're called to to be more responsible beings. And and sensory engagement through writing about it, through art, through scientific studies, all of it through music, all of these are, are ways to help. that in the process for each of us individually, but also collectively of reorienting back to the voice of the earth. Um, okay, uh, that's fantastic, David. Uh, we're really tight on time. Uh, Melissa, the, you, you did have a question. Uh, I don't know if you can spot that amongst the uh, the multiple choice questions I've pumped into the chat, uh, David. Uh, I don't know, Melissa, do you wanna quickly raise that question that you have or? David, can you spot that? Um, let me scroll. I'm scrolling down through the. Uh... And I, don't worry, everybody. I'll read out the questions so that uh, those are people who have been unable. Yeah. So, um, sort of listening meditation. Can it help us break the barrier of limited language to describe sonic experience? Um, I uh, partly. I think there are the parts of sonic experience that can't be put into language and. Every music critic ever has struggled with this. You know, how do you describe the experience of listening to a song or a symphony or something? You can get part of the way there, but you can't fully fully capture it. But when I'm, te- so I teach undergraduates quite a lot. And um, I mean, that's what I spend most of my weeks doing. And a lot of that is is helping them with their writing. And one of the things we do is go out and try and pay attention with our ears and with our noses and fingertips. and practice of sensory meditation, listening also, or other senses, gives us material so to be able to write about the world in a truthful, authentic, and persuasive way. If we haven't paid attention properly, we're just kind of making stuff up. And even if we've got a rich vocabulary and we're the best writer in the world, if we weren't paying attention when we were sitting outside um, or sitting inside wherever it was, we don't have any memory to draw on to be able to to write about. And so I tell my students, you know, the first practice is to go out and pay attention, which is fun. I mean, it's so much more fun to do that than, you know, do your 
chemistry homework or your math calculations. I mean, those are fun in their own way. Um, but this is, in terms of a class assignment, is easy. Just go outside and listen. And when your mind wanders, listen some more. And I give them hints about listen for the physicality of sound and come up with some analogies. And what does this remind you of? And what do you hear when you really strain to hear the quietest possible sound? So I give them lots of little pointers along the way. But I do think that paying attention really helps in that way. And it reveals all sorts of stuff that we didn't realize was there in the first place. Like, where I, the university that I work at, on the hour they play the Westminster chimes, which are the sounds of Big Ben. So this you know, is a very English sound, and they're playing it in the Tennessee woodlands. Um, and then the American frogs are singing at the same time. And so you have this amazing convergence of two different species, but from two completely different continents. Partly there's a story of colonialism there, Partly there's a story of music. I mean, there are all sorts of interpretations one can make, but until you notice the convergence, you can't you know, write about it. So one of the things I really listen for is unusual convergences. And I made a, I mean, really just for fun, a, a, an album a few years ago about water sounds and human sounds and places where they converge. Like water running around down a drain, in a train station where trains are going the other way and there's a, there's a beaker system. So it's all, there are different forms of motion and energy all kind of meeting in one place and then going on their own ways. But I challenged myself to go out and record some of these. I think of them as sort of field compositions where I, I'm not composing anything. I'm just composing by placing the microphone in it at a point of interesting convergence. And it, for me, that's playing around. It's exploring the world, but it is a great stimulus to curiosity, and it makes makes sitting in a train station a lot more interesting too. <laughs> so. Well, brilliant. Thank you, David, and thank you for fielding some questions, and thanks to the audience for for, uh, for sending them in. Uh, Emma, you want to speak? You may. No, don't, not, not necessarily, because it's not really a question. I just wanted to um, thank David for his book and um, say how much fun we been having with it um well, thanks. in perhaps unusual ways <laughs> no well, thank you yeah. and if you want me to come in by zoom and chat with the group or something just you know drop me a line i'd be happy to do that, that i mean easy. it sounds like I'm, I'm delighted to to read that and would love i wish i were there that i could participate <laughs> yeah well maybe one day we could sort that out All right thank you yeah. While we're tallying, let me say, so the, the soundscape designation in Japan is the, it's called the 100 Soundscapes of Japan, uh, where they, they took nominations from all over the country. And some of them are cultural sounds, some are natural sounds. And um, yeah, unfortunately, they haven't updated this. But I think a, a soundscape designations that were renewed or added to each year would, would be marvelous, but they certainly this was an official act by the Ministry of the Environment there. So well done and congratulations. And David, thank you very much. Jet oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. New York. Um, once again, you know, uh, I promise you guys it's a really good read. So if you didn't win the ebook, um, do, do go out and read the book. And I still feel rather bad because um, I'm the founder and the creator of the Urban Tree Festival, and I haven't actually read either of the books uh, which uh, David has written about trees and the forest. So um, I've got some reading to do, and I'm looking forward to that. But uh, a big thank Thanks. you to everybody uh, for coming along. We hope to see you again online uh, with Walk, Listen, Create. And uh, David, the last word, last word from you, sir. Well, I wish everyone good sounds in the in the coming week and whatever season of, of the year it is. And I hope you will have some time to just get out and, and swim in the in the physicality of, of sound. See, see where that experience and curiosity leads you. Hey everybody, uh, good luck. See you all soon. And once okay. again, big thank you, David. Thank you. It's great to be with you all. Thank you.